Snail by Joel Garcia. Year 1974, Toronto. On a hot summer afternoon at a construction site, a worker is shoveling when suddenly they hit something. After clearing a bit of soil, the worker called for others to help. After digging a bit more, they uncovered a poorly formed steel cube that was about 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters. They knew they couldn't just leave it there, so they wrestled it out of the ground. You could see some slight cracks around the center of that steel cube. They carried it away for a couple of feet. One of them lost their grip and so they dropped it on the ground. The heavy cube hit the ground and split in half. They looked over at the split cube. Strange, the center of the cracked opens cube had borrowing marks. The workers are a bit relieved that now the cube is in too easier to carry pieces which they then carry away. In the dirt, where the cube landed, a snail slinks onward. About two weeks later, a hot evening a man is having a drink at a bar. He's had quite a few drinks up to this point. He takes a final swig, nods at the bartender and walks out. He's not stumbling drunk, but he's not 100% sure-footed either. He enters his small bachelor apartment takes off his collar button down shirt, reveals his sweat-stained white tank top. He walks towards the window that's propped open with a novel. He opens up the window further, takes a deep breath, and stares outside for a bit. He doesn't notice the slimy trail along the side of the edge of the window. He puts the window back down, making sure the book is still holding it open a bit. He kicks off his shoes and walks over to his chair and slumps down. Something startles him, and he looks down as something stung his foot. Then he looks at his hands, confused. For some reason, they're going numb. He then slumps back in his chair, and his head falls back and to the side. He is sitting there paralyzed with a blank stare. Four days later, Heavy knocking at the apartment door. Mr. Graham, are you there? Open up, please. Mr. Graham, you hear keys jingle and the door opening. Two officers enter, one young and one older. The landlord peeks in from the hallway. The young officer is shocked and turns away from the terrible stench. The older officer grimaces, but recognizes that smell. That smell of a dead body. Both of them walk over to the body slumped in the chair, with the landlord cowering behind. When they get to the body, they look at the slumped man's face. They're equally shocked at the sight. Mr. Graham's face looked bored out. The eye is gone, and it looks like something dug into his skull via his eye socket. Out the window, down the street, along the roadside. A few kilometers away, a snail moves onward. Year 1913, Gloucester. On the outskirts of Gloucester, it's 3 a.m. Lightning is flashing, thunder is pounding, and the rain is pouring on this lonely farmhouse. It's absolutely dark inside. The door opens. The father of the house walks in. Mr. Morris closes the door behind him, takes a couple of steps, and then stops. He turns his head and sees his young son there staring up at him. Mr. Morris is dripping wet from the rain, but also some dark, thick, goopy stuff drips slowly from his hands onto the floor. Go back to bed, boy, Mr. Morris said. His son then turns and enters the kids' room where his other two sisters are sleeping. The bedroom door closes. Mr. Morris then stomps forward into his room, leaving a messy trail. Outside near the farmhouse, a patch of muddy ground starts shifting. Something struggles to get to the surface. A snail emerges from the mud and moves onward to the farmhouse. It's about 5 a.m. in the morning. 
The boy Shaw and his two sisters, Myla and Amber, are cleaning up the wet, goopy mess their father left behind. Myla perks her head up and says, Should someone check on Da? Ember and Shaw just stared at each other. Then Myla says, I'll go. Myla walks by her sister and brother and slowly enters their father's room. A few moments later, Shaw and Ember hear Myla scream. They get up and rush to their father's room. It is still dark in the room, but you can see the kids staring at their father's bed. Their father lays there, with his head turned to the side with a bored out eye socket. Dark, dried blood all over his face and bed. Shaw gets closer to his father and sees his father's one remaining eye staring up at nothing. Then Myla screams again and then falls to the ground. Ember turns toward her sister on the ground and then screams as well. Ember backs away. Shaw runs to Myla and sees something moving on her leg. Shaw grabs it and throws it across the room, while doing so screaming and looking at his hand. It burns, Shaw shrieks. Ember runs out of the room, but a couple moments later returns with a wet towel and gives it to Shaw. Ember and Shaw look at Myla's face, just staring up at the ceiling in a catatonic state. Ember looks to where Shaw threw the snail, the snail is there creeping towards them. Shaw picks up Myla. We must take her to town, Shaw exclaims. Ember nods. They all then rush out of the farmhouse. About an hour later, an old horse-drawn cart from barrels is going down the muddy road. The cart then is halted by the driver. What have we here then, the driver says. The driver looks to the down by the side of the road and sees Shaw carrying Myla and Ember by his side. Twelve hours later, a faint scream is heard by a nurse in a hospital. The nurse then enters a large room with a long line of medical beds. The nurse approaches the bed with the distraughted Myla. A doctor walks over and asks, is this the child that was in a catatonic state? The nurse answers, yes doctor. Myla asks while whimpering, where's Shaw, where's Ember? The doctor says, they're fine. Now that you're awake, and when you feel well, you'll be with them. Myla cries back at the doctor. I wasn't sleeping. The doctor and the nurse look confused. Four days later. It's a dark, dreary day as a couple enter the orphan asylum of Gloucester. The couple is led into an office. The gentleman behind the desk asks, Yes? I'm Edwin Morris, and this is my wife, Eula. And you are Mr. Ecker? Mr. Ecker replies, with his voice sounding a little more somber. Yes, I'm the administrator here. Please sit. Edwin and Eula take a seat, while Mr. Ecker loudly says, Miss Hutton. A nurse pops her head into the door. Mr. Ecker continues, Please bring the Morris children. Miss Hutton nods yes, then looks towards Edwin and Eula. Her face saddens and she then turns and walks away. Edwin feels uneased by the nurse's expression and asks Ecker, is something wrong? Mr. Ecker pauses for a few seconds, then speaks, I'm afraid that little Ember Morris has passed on. Edwin and Eula look at each other, then Eula whimpers into Edwin's shoulder. Edwin asks, what happened? Mr. Ecker answers, last night she succumbed to an affliction some sort of disease that ravaged her neck area, which caused her to bleed out. Edwin asks, Affliction? May I see the body? Mr. Ecker, of course. Mr. Ecker stands up and walks to the door. Edwin stands and says to Eula, Wait here, and Edwin follows Mr. Ecker. Miss Hutton, the nurse, just then brings Shaw and Myla, and they sit them down by a bench on the hall. Edwin approaches them and kneels down to the ground. Edwin speaks to them. Shaw, Myla, I'm Uncle Edwin. Eula leaves the office and comes to the kid's side as well. Edwin continues. This is your Aunt Eula. You probably won't remember us. Eula, stay with them. I'll be right back. Edwin stands up and motions to Ecker to continue on to Amber. Mr. Ecker unlocks the room and then they enter. There's a metal gurney with a sheet covering over the child's body. 
Mr. Eckert stops at the gurney and looks at Edwin and asks, Are you sure you wish to? Edwin scowls at Mr. Ecker and nods yes, certainly. Mr. Ecker peels back the sheet. Edwin stares and braces himself on the gurney, exclaiming, Good God! God forgive me. I should have come here sooner. Edwin grieves for a bit, gives a blessing, and then steps back. Mr. Ecker then covers Amber. Edwin turns to Mr. Ecker and angrily asks, What possible disease could do this? Mr. Ecker tries to answer, I don't know at this time. The skin wasn't cut, nor is this similar to any kind of bite. Edwin quickly starts out the door, back towards the remaining children. Mr. Ecker hastily locks up the room and catches up with Edwin. Edwin then says, The missus and I are leaving for Canada in two months' time. Until then, I'll be demanding a thorough investigation on Ember's death. Edwin stops and faces Mr. Ecker. There is no issue with us leaving today with Shaw and Myla. Mr. Ecker, no, no issue. Just a signature. Edwin continues briskly walking. Once Eula and the children was in sight, Edwin loudly says, Eula, please take Shaw and Myla out of here. I'll be with you shortly. Edwin enters Mr. Ecker's office, with Mr. Ecker following behind. Eula motions to the kids to get up and move on. Under the bench by Shaw's foot, something squirms in the shadows. In the office, Edwin finishes signing some papers, takes his copies, and storms out. Mr. Ecker stands up and walks to the window, where he can see Edwin meet up with Eula and the two remaining children. Mr. Ecker says quietly to himself, Good Lord, I believe that family is cursed. Year, 1928. Fifteen years, 5,420 kilometers later, Toronto. In a warehouse in the east end of Toronto, you hear buzzing, hammering, and grilling. Street guards are being constructed here. In the corner of the warehouse is three men working on a half-assembled streetcar. Two underneath the lining and axle, while one is on top soldering. Whoa. The man that was once on top of the streetcar is now laying on the ground facing up. One of the men working under the streetcar looked over and did a double take. He realized that there's a man down. He grabs the other man by the sleeve and pulls him over for him to observe the fallen man. They both rush to the man down. One of them yells, Shaw, are you alright? Shaw is stiff, just staring up. The man then says, William, go get the foreman, would ya? William hurries off. William returns with the foreman and plant manager. The plant manager asks, what happened here, Gary? Gary answers, can't say, sir. Seems that he has fallen. Shaw is still breathing, though. The plant manager then barks some new orders. William and Gary, carry him out to the truck. I'll take him to the hospital. Both William and Gary answer with a I. William and Gary carry Shaw out of the warehouse and is heading toward the truck. William is carrying Shaw by the legs and some dripping blood catches his eye. William says, oh hell, blood is coming out of his trousers, Gary. They reach the truck. Gary lowers the truck's back gate. Then they lift Shaw on board. William repeats. Gary, there's blood. Gary snaps back. Yes, I heard ya. I'm going to open the front gate. You check on the bleeding. Gary rushes off, and William starts raising Shaw's pant leg. William sees some scarring and blood on Shaw's leg, then finds the snail. William picks up the snail and looks at it closely. William still has his work gloves on, so he's able to hold the snail for a moment. But then William yelps and throws the snail away. William looks at his glove, which has some holes at the fingertips now, and his fingers are scarred with a bit of blood. The plant manager storms out to the truck, and Gary is back with William. The plant manager then says, good work, you two, but get back to work. 
The plant manager starts up the truck and drives off. Gary lights up the smoke. William looks at his hand. Gary asks, Are you alright, William? William nods yes. Gary says, Close the front gate, would ya? Gary takes a puff, throws away the cig, and goes back inside. After William closed the gate, he returns to where he threw the snail. It is there, creeping towards the warehouse doors. William motions to stomp the snail with his boot, but then halts and recalls what happened to his hand. He looks around and finds a shovel, walks up to the snail and smacks it. A bit of smoke rises from the crushed snail, and there is some damage to the shovel which made contact with it. William looks at the snail, it's still squirming, and in a moment's time it starts creeping again. William appears flabbergasted at the sight. He then gets an idea and runs inside. William returns with a metal bucket and a canister of fuel. He puts the bucket and canister down. He takes the shovel and quickly scoops the snail up and dumps it into the bucket. William pours fuel into the bucket next. Gets a match from a matchbox that was in his pocket. Lights it and drops it in. Flames immediately arise. William places the shovel over the bucket to try to cover it. The foreman pops his head out of the warehouse door and yells, William, what the hell is keeping you? 3 a.m. Shaw lays in a hospital bed motionless, staring up at the ceiling. Once 12 hours pass since he went catatonic, Shaw starts to blink, then exclaims, God help me. Later at 4 p.m., Shaw walks out of the hospital, accompanied by his wife and two sons. The Shaw family walk for a while. Shaw's wife holds them close. Shaw then stops and turns to his wife to say, Dear, you and the boys head home now. I'm going to stop by work. Let them know I'll be good to come back tomorrow. Shaw's wife then says, So soon? Are you sure you'll be fine for work? Shaw answers, We cannot afford me taking time off. I am good. I can feel my strength coming back, Shaw's wife says. If that's what you think is best. Shaw, yes. Oh, and as well, I'll be home late. A few things I must attend to with some lads that helped me out yesterday. Shaw's wife replies with a bit of anger. Late? You were near dead for a day's time. What are you up to? Shaw tries to calm her down. I understand your concern, dear. I can't explain it now, but afterwards I will. Shaw crouches down to his kids. Boys, I hope to be home before you go to bed. If not, Shaw then gives them both a hug. Shaw stands back up, kisses his still upset wife on the cheek, then heads off. Shaw arrives at the warehouse. He walks through the factory floor. A few fellow workers acknowledge him and are glad to see him back. Shaw reaches the plant manager's office, knocks, then enters. Ten minutes later, Shaw approaches to where William and Gary are working. Gary sees him first. Gary exclaims, Shaw, good to see you. William follows up. How's the head, old man? Shaw looks around at the ground by his feet for a second and says, Still in one piece. I want to thank you lads for helping me out yesterday. Gary says, no worries. Shaw says, well, after work I was hoping to buy you lads a couple pints. Oh, that's not Ness. Gary interrupts. Sounds brilliant, Shaw. Right, William? William answers, oh, right. A couple of hours later at the pub, William, Gary, and Shaw are in mid-conversation. Shaw explains, I was awake the whole time. I could hear and see everything, Gary. All that from a snail bite. By the way, what the hell is a snail? Shaw, have you seen a slug before? Gary nods yes. Like that, but with a shell. William cuts in, I saw the wee beast. It was crawling up your leg, and I took it. The slime on it ruined my glove, and it ate through to my fingers. I threw it, crushed it with a shovel, 
And it just kept moving, Gary asked. So what did you do next? William continued, I thought it maybe I could burn it. So I grabbed a bucket and some petrol, scooped it, lit the fuel, and covered the top. This morning when I came to check on it, the bucket had a hole in the side and the wee thing got away. Shaw added, it followed me from England. Gary asked, come on, followed you from England? Shaw continued, when I was laying in the hospital all that time, I started remembering what happened when I was a kid. It killed my dad. It then bit my sister, Myla, and she fell into the same state as I. So, I carried her into town. At the time, I had another sister, Ember. She was with us. Shaw took a drink and spoke on. Myla were covered, but on the day we were going to leave the orphan house, I found my sister, Ember. Well, what was left of her. The three of them went silent for a while. Shaw said, Look lads, I don't think my troubles with this wee demon is over. I have an idea how to deal with it, and was hoping you guys could help. Gary asked, What do you have in mind, Shaw? 10 p.m. Shaw and Gary are standing by the front entrance gate of the warehouse. It's an industrial area of town. It's quiet, no other folks in sight. Moments later, a car pulls up. William gets out of the driver's seat and walks over. Gary said, so your brother-in-law trusts you? William answers, he's a good soul, as long as we don't damage it. Shaw, of course. Now, once we get in, William, you look for the little bugger. Gary, you check on the kiln as I'll be building the mold. The three broke through the fence gate, and with the crowbar they pry open the warehouse side entrance. Thirty minutes later, in the barely lit warehouse, Gary is looking over the kiln. Shaw is nearly done constructing the wooden box, and William is still looking around for the snail with a lantern in hand. William is getting frustrated and stops looking puts down the lantern and goes to light a cigarette. William is just about to bring the light match to the end of his cigarette when then he glances over at Shaw. It's hard to make out in the dark, but on the shelf behind Shaw, there's some kind of shadowy form stretching out. William drops the cig and yells, Shaw, behind you. Shaw turns and sees the little snail reaching towards him. Shaw steps back and stumbles. Gary hears the commotion and rushes over to Shaw. The snail then drops and lands on Shaw's shoe. Shaw quickly reacts and kicks it off. The snail flies in the air and splats on Gary's head. It burns. Gary swats it off onto the ground. Shaw starts to get up to run over to Gary, and William begins to come over as well. But then Gary yells, Stop! Everyone just stay still. Shaw and William freeze. Gary then starts barking orders. William, throw me a clean rag. And you, Shaw, bring your box. William passes over a rag from his back pocket. Gary places the rag on his wounded head while still keeping an eye on the snail. Gary then says, William, get two shovels. Shaw brings his wooden box. Gary tells him, place it here at the bottom of the kiln. Place a steel weight against it to secure the box. Shaw does that, while making sure to step nowhere near the snail on the ground. The snail keeps creeping towards Shaw. William comes with two shovels. Gary reaches out and says, give me one. William complies. Gary then whacks the snail. The loud smack is gratifying to Gary. Gary says, okay, back off Shaw, and you as well, William. Gary starts pouring some molten steel into the box. A little bit leaks out the side of the edges, but the box manages to hold strong. Once the box is half full, Gary tells William, push that snail onto my shovel. William pushes the gooey snail. Gary then quickly lifts up the shovel and holds it over the box. 
The snail's acidic secretions are melting the shovel. The snail then drops through the shovel into the center of the box. It starts violently sizzling on the hot steel. Gary starts pouring more steel into the box, covering the snail. He stops once the steel is at the top of the box. Gary then steps back and sits down. William passes a cigarette to Gary and Shaw and takes one for himself. They light up the cigs and all have a good laugh. It's about 11.30 p.m. and the three are in the car. William is driving them to the outskirts of the city. It's now 12.45 a.m. Shaw, William, and Gary are patting the ground with their shovels. The steel box is now six feet under. Shaw crouches over the burial spot and says, For you, Ember. William then suggests, Should we say a prayer? Gary barks back, Fuck no. Year 2011, Eureka. Action news music starts. Fade in on a newscaster sitting at a desk. Good evening, I'm Ron Lamont, and this is the CTNV 5 Action News, says Ron Lamont. Our first story, an explosion erupts at an army base, NH Newhorn, just outside of the town of Eureka. Video footage showing an army base with plumes of smoke rising. The camera then pans to show the destruction. Ron continues. On the scene is our field reporter, Jim Morris. The newscast switches to a man standing in front of a fence. Behind the fence, you can see the army base with some damage and smoke. Also a bunch of debris laying about. Jim starts. At around 3.30 p.m. this afternoon, an explosion occurred here at NH Newhorn Army Base. There's no explanation for the explosion at this time. Nor is there any news of how many have been injured or worse. But I do have an official release from the base commander. It reads, There has been an incident late this afternoon here at NH Newhorn. There is no known cause as of yet. But a full report will be made public once any new information becomes available. At this time, we are putting out a warning to the citizens of Eureka and anyone in the surrounding area that due to some chemical fumes released by the eruption, there may be some adverse effects on the populace. We ask that if any citizens in the area feel an onset of illness, especially if involving falling into a coma-like state, to please contact us directly here at the base. We have specialists standing by to help. The number to call is 888-909-3410. The newscast puts up a chiron at the bottom of the screen saying, Feeling ill in Eureka? Call 888-909-3410. Ron at the news desk then says, For the duration of this broadcast, we will have the basis contact information available at the bottom of the screen. If anybody in Eureka area succumbed to any strange illness, to please contact them. So Jim, is there any... The camera that was filming Jim at the location starts to pan down and then stops. All you can see now is dirt. Ron is a bit concerned. Jim, is everything alright there? Jim answers, everything is fine. Seems we have a tripod malfunction here. I'm Jim Morris at the Army Base, NH Newhorn. Back to you, Ron. Ron smiles a bit and says, Thank you, Jim. We'll get back to Jim if any new information comes available. Next up. In Washington, President Obama and the congressional leaders of both parties said late Sunday that they have agreed to a framework for a budget deal that would cut trillions of dollars in federal spending over the next... Ron stops due to some loud yelling in the back of the studio. Ron puts his finger to his ear and says, What's happening? Ron turns his head and looks to the monitor and says, Is that happening now? Oh, good God. The newscast abruptly breaks to commercial. Year 1980, Warm Springs. 
A woman with a scarred face is in a straitjacket sitting in the center of a padded room. She is trying to stay up, trying to stay on guard, but occasionally she drifts off to sleep. Later, a gentle knock on the door. Time for a little chat, Miss Graham. Miss Graham, accompanied by two nurses, walk along the hallway. They approach the room. Miss Graham exclaims, Did you check it? The nurse answers, Yes, Miss Graham. We thoroughly checked the room. During the interview, a doctor asks a question. So you said before, this evil that keeps coming back is in the form of a snail? Miss Graham remains quiet. The doctor, Please talk to me. We need to... Miss Graham interrupts. What? I'm just going to repeat what I said. I hear myself say it and I don't even believe it. Miss Graham gives the doctor a desperate look of despair. I even set it on fire, burned it to ashes, then put it in a box and made sure the garbage truck took it away. Doctor, yes. And two months later, Miss Graham finishes the doctor's sentence. Two months later, he came back and did this to my face. Doctor questions. The same sale. Miss Graham then goes quiet. The doctor continues. Mr. Roberts, your landlord confirms that he found you paralyzed on the floor with a, well, he said slug. But it was this thing on your face. Miss Graham. I can see it. I couldn't move, and it climbed up on my face. I could see it. Whenever I close my eyes, I always see it. A week later, Miss Graham's eyes open. She nodded off for a while, sitting in the middle of the padded room. Slowly her eyes focuses and then sees it. The snail is coming towards her. She is stunned, but instead of yelling for help, she murmurs, fuck you. She then lies down and rolls at it. A crunch sound is made when she rolls over it, but also she feels a sharp sting. She stops rolling and is lying on the floor with her head facing the crushed snail. She is paralyzed again. Can't yell. Cannot even blink her eyes. The snail starts moving towards her in its crushed state, slowly. An hour later, a nurse barges in to find Miss Graham dead with a bald, bloodied face. The nurse screams for help. Out of the cell, along the hallway edge, a snail moves away while feet from nurses run by, back to the room. Year 1988. Eight years, 3,093 kilometers later, Norristown. A light rainy afternoon on a rural road where you see a father and son gas station. A large sign reads out front, Jacob and Son's Garage. The father, Jacob Spencer, is under a car working on it. His son, Thomas, walks by. Need any help there? Mr. Spencer replies, just some coffee would be good. Thomas walks into the office where the coffee maker is and notices that it's empty. Thomas yells back, gotta make a fresh pot. Mr. Spencer loudly answers, yep. Fifteen minutes later, Thomas walks into the work area with a cup of coffee then sees his father in a catatonic state under the car. Thomas drops the cup and rushes to his father. Mr. Spencer's face has a stunned expression and no matter how much Thomas shakes him, his dad does not respond. Thomas looks down at his father's leg and notices one pant leg torn open and some blood. He then sees a snail by his father's hip moving up along his body. Thomas smacks the snail and shrieks a bit. He feels burning to the skin that made contact with the snail. Thomas stands up and quickly goes to the office to call for help. Thomas on the phone. He's gone stiff. He's just staring. Yes. He's still breathing. But it's weak. Okay, good. Get here quick. Thomas goes back into the garage and is surprised to see that that snail has managed to creep back and is now on his father's shoulder. 
Thomas angrily exclaims, What the fuck is your problem? Thomas kicks the snail across the garage, then walks over to it and stomps it. Thomas looks at the bottom of his boot, and the part that made contact with snail is melting off. Thomas goes back to his dad and continues trying to shake him out of his state. Ten minutes later, Thomas looks up at the clock and then back towards his father. Hold on, old man. They'll get here. Thomas looks over at the snail and sees a mangled mess with a cracked shell still moving towards his father. Thomas is confused by the sight. He then walks into the office and returns with a shotgun, aims and blasts the mangled snail away. About 12 hours later at the hospital, Thomas is sitting in the hospital lobby, sleeping. A doctor gently wakes Thomas. Thomas enters his father's hospital room and approaches his bed where you can see his father groggy but awake. How are you doing? Thomas asks. Mr. Spencer, I think I'm alright. It's very strange. Thomas, what's strange? Mr. Spencer, I was awake the whole time. I just couldn't move. Thomas, awake? Mr. Spencer, what the hell did you shoot at? Did something attack me? Thomas, God, um, I don't know what to say. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. I don't believe it. Mr. Spencer just looks puzzled. Thomas changes the subject. What's the doctor saying? Mr. Spencer. Oh, they're doing some tests on my blood, but they can't explain why I was paralyzed. Thomas, really? Well, what now? Mr. Spencer. I don't know, son. You should go home. I feel like I just need some sleep. Thomas, no, nah, I'll stay. Mr. Spencer, go home. Come back tomorrow. I'm better now, just need some sleep. The next day, Mr. Spencer started walking around and gained a lot of his strength back. Thomas could take him home now. Thomas drove his father to the station, parks the car. They get out of the car and Thomas says, I should have dropped you off at home. Nah, I'm good. I'll sit out here and help with the pumps. Thomas relents. Fine. I'll finish up with Mr. Braxton's car. 34 minutes later, while Thomas is under the car, you can hear a bell ring twice. A car pulled up to the pumps. Thomas moves away from under the car and gets up. Thomas then walks past his father, sitting outside. I got this. You stay there. Thomas goes straight to the car by the pumps. He approaches the passenger window. Just one gentleman is at the wheel. Thomas crouches down and speaks through the open passenger window. Hi, sir. What do you need? The driver begins, I need, then stops. Looks past Thomas with a puzzled face. Is he okay? Thomas looks back and sees his father slumped to the side on the chair that he was sitting. Thomas quickly runs back to his dad. His father has a stunned look on his face. On the ground, blood pooled by his feet and a large blood stain on his shirt by his chest. Thomas kneels down, opens his father's button-down shirt. It looks like something dug through his chest. You can even see some ribs. Thomas looks back at the car by the pumps. The car kicks up dust and drives away. Thomas stands up with his hands out in front of him, dripping with blood. Thomas opens the door to the office, walks in and sits at the chair. On the desk you can see some papers and the phone. Thomas just sits there for a minute, staring out the window. Thomas picks up the receiver on the phone. And just when he's about to begin dialing, he's startled by a sharp pain in his leg. Thomas looks down between his legs to the floor. His whole body goes numb and his head thumps on the desk. He is paralyzed now, staring down at the floor. Then, sees the snail crawling up his leg. Year 1997. Nine years, 3,812 kilometers later. 
Irvine. It's a blistering hot summer day. In a parking lot in front of an office building on the hot asphalt, a snail is moving onward. A car pulls into the parking lot, drives over the snail, the tires barely miss it. The car engine stops. A driver gets out and walks to the passenger side and opens the door. They then pull out a large box and drop it onto the ground. They then scourge through the box, take a couple things out, and walk into the office building. The snail keeps creeping towards the box. The man walks into the office area, heads towards a conference room, and yells, Conference room. The man enters the conference room and waits. Two men and a woman walk into the room. One of them says, What's going on, Max? Max says sternly, Please sit. While they take a seat, Max throws a book onto the table. The book is a copy of the 1997 The Morris Guide to Los Angeles Orange County Street Guide and Directory. One of the people seated grabbed the book and said, Yeah, so it's our Los Angeles edition. Max then throws them a newspaper that was already opened and had an article highlighted. A different person seated took the paper and read the highlighted article. Our paper have been receiving concerns from Christian groups regarding the recent release of the Morris Guide, which boasted adding 666 new streets this year. The Christians feared that the use of the number 666 was some kind of satanic signal. After reading the article, they said, Oh, come on. So what? This article is on page 12. Max replied, our message boards are flooded with complaints, and some bookstores and gas stations are starting to send copies back. Do a recall and start printing a new edition with a revised cover. Max then leaves the room. One of the men seated said, well, I guess we can adjust the 666 to 665. The woman that was seated on the side said, 665, the neighbor of the beast. Max left the office and went back to his car. He approached a box on the ground, picked it up, and put it back into the passenger seat. The snail was climbing on the side of that box, and when the box hit the seat, the snail fell into the car floor. Max didn't notice. He shut the passenger door, walked around, and got into the driver's seat. Max drove out of the parking lot and onto the road. Twenty minutes later, Max was driving out of town. The sun was still blistering hot. Barely any traffic was on the road at this time. Most of all the trees in the surrounding area were all cleared out, and there were some sparse building developments. Then suddenly, Max felt a sting. His body went limp and leaned to the side. Now the car was just drifting on the road. There was no other cars around to hit. After about a minute, the car then drifted to the left and off the road. The area was pretty bare, just dried dirt and grassy patches. The car went down a hill and plowed into some rocks. The car ended up on its right side. Max was buckled in, so his body hung and his arms dangled down towards the ground. Max could see the snail. It climbed up Max, until it reached to the top of his head, then proceeded to dig in, this time going through the ear. Year 2007, 10 years, 3,930 kilometers later, New York. It's 3 a.m. and stormy over an old age home. There are a couple of cop cars parked in front, and then another cop car comes rushing in with its lights on. It stops by the front, and a uniformed officer quickly gets out of the car and runs inside the building. The cop approaches the desk, where a nurse is on the phone. The officer asks, is she okay? The nurse recognizes the cop. 
She is frozen. She doesn't know what to say. She then turns her head and looks down the hall. The officer then rushes down that hall. Another uniform officer is standing guard in front of room 108. They see the officer coming and begins to walk towards him gesturing him to stop. Hold it Jackson, you can't go in there. Jackson protests. Let me through, that's my mother. Hey mom! Mom, do you hear me? A detective comes out of the room and helps hold off Jackson and says, I can't let you in. She's gone, Jackson. How is she gone? She was fine just a while ago. Two forensic officers are working in Miss Jackson's room. One is taking photos, and the other is packing up samples. The one taking photos noticed something strange and says, What the? Hey, look. The other perks her head up and looks towards what the other is staring at. A snail slowly creeps up the wall. The sample guy says, that's odd. Hey, throw me that towel. The photographer does just that. And the other guy then sandwiches the na nail in the towel. A bit of smoke and sizzling is heard inside the towel, but then the guy quickly throws it into a bio waste bag. The two forensic officers leave the room with some equipment and a bio waste bag. One of them says, we're done. You can call in for transport. By the way, we found a snail in there. Miss Jackson didn't have it as a pet or anything. Jackson answers, no. The forensic person then says, all right. The detective and Officer Jackson had nothing to add. The forensic officer walked down the hall and stopped at the nurse's station. They hold up a bio waste bag and ask, can you throw this with the bio disposal? The nurse answers, sure, just leave it. She peers down another hall and calls, Richard, this is for bio disposal. The forensic team leaves. Richard comes and picks up the garbage bag and walks over to the disposal chute. Richard jerks the bag a bit when he thinks he heard something move inside. Richard shrugs it off and then drops the bag down the bio waste chute. The bag ends up into a large metal bin with biohazard symbols all over it. Back at the room, the detective lets Jackson see the body. Jackson approaches the bed. A bed sheet is covering his mother with blood stains soaked through. Jackson slowly pulls on the sheet to reveal her blank stare up at the ceiling, and the side of her neck is gouged out, just reaching to her spine. Dark, dried blood is everywhere. Next morning, the disposal company truck arrives to pick up a load. A disposal worker exits the truck and notices that the bottom corner of the container has a hole bored out of it. Blood mixed with biomatter is oozing. 11 a.m., Jackson enters his captain's office in his precinct. The captain and the detective is there. The captain says, please sit, Jackson. Jackson does so. The captain continues, so Dwayne, first off, me and the department is sorry for your loss. Dwayne Jackson replies, thank you, sir. Captain says, do you require time off? Dwayne replies, no, sir, I prefer to stay on duty. The captain says, that's fine. But while the investigation is being conducted, you will be on desk duty. Dwayne questions. Why desk duty, sir? Detective pipes in. Because we don't know if the attack on your mother was random, or retaliation against your family, or against the department. Do you have any idea who would want to mutilate your mother like that? Dwayne starts squeezing the chair handles and gives the detective a slight evil look, but contains his anger and says sternly, No, sir. The captain chimes in. Ease up, detective. This happened just last night. The detective backs up a bit. The captain turns to Dwayne. I think it would be best to keep you working in the precinct until we can rule you out as a target. Dwayne gives a slight agreeing nod. The captain says, Your father passed away, and you just have a brother, right? 
Dwayne calms down a bit. My father died about two years ago, and yeah, I just have a brother, Milton. I haven't seen him in years, and I don't think he's been around to see mother either. The detective returns with, not true. According to the Holmes records, he's been around. He didn't visit as much as you, but at least once a month. You didn't know that. Dwayne's slightly surprised. No, I didn't know that. The detective asks, You got his number and address? Dwayne replies, I got an old number. Dwayne pulls out a flip phone, looks at his contacts, and takes out a pad and pen. Dwayne writes down the number, rips the page from his pad, and hands it over to the detective. The detective ends with, Fine for now. The captain says, Report to Clyborne. He'll sort you out. Dwayne nods to the captain and the detective, and then leaves the room. Nine days later, early in the evening, the snail approaches the 5th precinct from the road. The snail is about to make it to the sidewalk edge, but then a car wheel rolls over it and stops. It's a police cruiser with an officer in the driver's seat looking towards the precinct, waiting for someone. About a minute later, another officer enters the passenger side of the police cruiser. The officer in the driver's seat says, Ready Freddy? The officer answers, Let's roll. The cruiser goes for about three feet and then abruptly stops when one of the tires blows out. Twenty minutes later, the police cruiser is being raised by a car lift in the precinct's garage. The two officers are watching the mechanic rotate the busted tire to show the large hole. Some gooey gunk drops out of the hole and hits the floor with a splat. The mechanic backs off so not to get hit. The splat startled the two officers. All three of you are going to change the tire? The two officers got startled again when the approaching lieutenant yelled at them. The lieutenant then barked, You two, just sign out another patrol car. The two officers reply, Yes sir, and leave. The lieutenant then asked the mechanic, What happened? The mechanic is bending down looking at the gunk on the floor. I don't know. The mechanic grabs a large oily rag to gather up the gunk on the floor, and then tosses it to the side where there's a pile of rags and garbage. The mechanic stands up and observes the hole in the tire. Looks a bit melted, like the tire came in contact with some acid. The lieutenant responds with a, holy shit. Two hours later, on the floor of the precinct's garage, you can see a trail of gunk that goes from the pile of dirty rags to the large metal rack against the wall. The rack is full of car parts and tools. If you pan up above the rack, you can see the trail continue along the wall, leading to a vent with a melted hole in the corner. Later that evening, Dwayne Jackson is at his desk, wrapping things up. The officer area is almost abandoned. Dwayne stands up to leave. When the phone on his desk rings, he picks up the receiver. This is Jackson. He listens for a bit. I'll be right there, then hangs up. He heads to the front desk and sees his brother Milton Jackson standing there. Dwayne stands there for a moment then waves his brother to follow him into the office area. Dwayne walks towards the interrogation room while his brother follows. They walk in. Dwayne sits while his brother looks around puzzled. Dwayne says, it's quiet here, no one should bug us. This calms Milton. He then sits. Milton begins, look Dwayne, I don't know what to say, it's just that. Dwayne then interrupts. Wait, Milton. Actually, let me speak. Milton nods his head in agreement. Dwayne continues. So years ago, you were in a bad place. You robbed mom. You were fucked up. Milton nodded again. Yes, I was. Dwayne. I vowed never to forgive you and to keep you away from us. 
Milton, I know. And I did keep away. Dwayne, you visited Mom at the home. Milton, I did. Only in the past year. I've been clean over three years now. I got a steady job. I'm even seeing someone. Dwayne. Oh yeah? Milton. Her name is Lucy. I even brought her to see Mom once. They seemed to hit it off. Dwayne and Milton sat in silence for a bit. In the dark ventilation shaft, the snail creeps on. Just a bit of light emanates from the vent ahead of the snail. Then Dwayne says, Mom's funeral is tomorrow, so I guess you came here to ask if it's okay for you to go. Milton asks, Only if it's alright with you. Dwayne, After Dad died, I started regretting pushing you away like I did. I want you to come tomorrow. Maybe we can start things over. You know? Milton, I'd like that. They both stood up and shook hands. Then kind of changed it to a hug. Milton ended with, I'll see my way out. Milton went to the door and opened it and said, I'll see you tomorrow. Milton then turned and left. The door slowly closed. Dwayne stood there for a bit, smiled to himself then walked to the door, turned off the lights. As he opened the door, behind Dwayne was a sudden thump noise that startled him. Dwayne turned the light back on and walked back to the chair. The interrogation room door slowly closed. Dwayne walked to the chair. He looked up and noticed a hole in the vent above with a bit of slime dripping down. Dwayne looked down at the seat to see a snail sitting by the edge, right by his knee, and then its head went for him. Dwayne jumped back. Ouch! <laughs> Dwayne's body went numb, and then he falls. Four hours later, a janitor enters the interrogation room and is shocked to find Dwayne's body with a disfigured face and blood pooling around his head on the floor. The janitor leaves the room to get help, and the door slowly closes. And when the door closes shut, you can see at the bottom corner has a borrowed hole and a bit of a trail of blood. Ten days later, over a bridge, past the bay, the sun is shining over St. Jude's Cemetery. People are gathering for the funeral service of Officer Dwayne Jackson and his mother, Margaret Jackson. It's a mix of folks dressed in black and officers in full dress uniform. Three people are approaching from the parking lot. Milton recognizes them and goes over to meet them. The older gentleman and woman with another woman about Milton's age. Milton greets them. Uncle Peter and Sarah. Hello, Liz. They then join the others. Ten minutes into service. A car pulls into the parking lot. A woman leaves the car and walks towards the funeral. She then stops and observes the funeral from a distance. Ten more minutes into the service. The coffin has been lowered into the grave. Everyone's head is down while a priest is giving the last rites. The priest's words are suddenly interrupted by a loud outburst. Everyone starts looking around, wondering who shouted, and then all eyes look towards Milton. Milton's head tilts up. Then his face rests at a blank stare off into the distance. Milton's body then falls forward into the grave. Milton slams into the coffin face first. The coffin cracks a bit. Milton's face gets smashed, and his body slumps down the side of the grave. Everyone is panicking. Some jump into the grave to check on Milton. He's not breathing, someone screamed. Call a medic. In all this commotion, no one noticed the snail crawling up the grave wall. The woman that was watching the funeral from a distance runs into the crowd of people. She looks around, trying to grasp on what's going on. After some struggling, the family raised Milton's body out of the grave and onto the grass. 
Then another shriek from within the crowd, and Sarah has fallen down. Uncle Peter runs to her. He crouches down and lightly taps her face. She just gazes straight up into the sky. Liz runs over to ask, what happened? Is she alright? Mom. Peter answers, she's just fainted. Help me get her to the car. Peter and Liz carry Sarah away. Someone in the crowd yells, Peter, what the hell has happened? Peter stutters while talking back. My wife, she's... I'm taking her to the hospital. Liz opens the back door of the car. Peter puts her limp body into the back seat. Liz shuts the back door, then enters the passenger seat. Peter gets into the driver's seat, starts the car, and leaves the lot while swerving around the other parked cars. The strange woman gets through the crowd and ends up standing over Milton's body. A man is checking for vitals and exclaims, he's dead. I think he broke his neck on the fall. A person that was in the way moves, and the strange woman gets a clear view of Milton's crushed in face eyes glaring, and head awkwardly bent to the side. The woman asks, Is that Milton Jackson? Someone answers, Yes. Dead at his own brother's and mother's funeral. The woman then asks, Is Sarah Jackson here? Someone else says, Milton's aunt. The woman nods, Yes. They then continue, She fainted, and her husband and daughter drove off. The woman drove off to? The man answers, a hospital. Who are you? The woman then realizes she is a stranger here. Oh, I, I have some info that might explain. Someone blurts out, explain? Ain't nothing, explain this shit, lady. The woman backs away. She walks a bit, and then sees the priest, and then goes to ask him, excuse me, father. The priest jerks towards her, yes. The woman asks, Father, do you know where the closest hospital is? The priest answers with concern. Are you hurt, my child? The woman says, I'm okay, Father. The hospital? The priest, oh yes, just across the bridge and go right. You'll see signs for the Lennox Hill Hospital. The woman runs off to her car and shouts, Thank you, Father. The priest, may God go with you. On the bridge, Peter is driving frantically, and Liz looks to the back seat, checking on her mother. Peter asks, how is she? Liz answers, it seems like she's breathing. Liz then faces forward and warns her father, Jesus, Dad, slow down a bit. The car passes a car and quickly changes lanes. Peter says, I got it, honey. In the back seat, Sarah is paralyzed, but there seems to be some movement under her dress. Liz looks to the back seat and notices something dripping. Something is dripping from the end of her mother's dress. She reaches down to touch it, the thick liquid, and then looks closely at it. Blood. She blurts out. Peter yells, what? Liz reaches for her mother's dress and lifts to reveal blood running along her legs. Liz screams. She's bleeding. Peter jolts around to try to take a look. Liz reacts to the car drifting to the left and goes for the steering wheel to help correct the car, but the car goes into the medium which finally tilts the car. Then the car flips onto its roof and slides along while also hitting other cars. Thirteen minutes later, the strange woman is driving along the bridge. The traffic ahead of her starts slowing down. She peers into the distance and sees smoke rising. Her heart starts racing. Something in her head demands she must push on. At the crash site, Peter becomes conscious but still heavily dazed, and smoke is all around making it hard to see. Peter and Liz are hanging upside down. Their seatbelts are still holding them. Peter turns to his daughter, Liz, he mumbles. He's able to reach out to his daughter's head and turns it a bit. To his shock, he sees this weird formation on her face. He grabs it and brings it in close for a look. A snail with a cracked shell and blood dripping from it. He then throws it out the passenger window. Peter then looks at his hands and sees his skin damaged and bloody. 
The strange woman is driving along the emergency lane, passing all the stopped cars. She comes upon an opening and looks over and sees the flipped car with smoke rising from it. She drives a bit further, looks back at the car wreck. She doesn't know why, but she feels she must stop. Peter was able to unbuckle himself and now is struggling with Liz who is passed out. A person wrenches the passenger car door open and yells, Hey, is anyone alive in there? Peter screams, Get my daughter out. Liz gets unbuckled and is dragged out. Peter crawls out afterwards. The person is checking on Liz when Peter then pushes them away and picks her up and then starts marching along the highway. He knows that he must get her to the hospital. The strange woman then gets out of her car and sees Peter limping towards her with his daughter in his arms. She is standing there in shock. She doesn't know what to do. The woman then breaks her trance and then runs to Peter. She approaches Peter and Liz, and Peter is repeating, Liz, my baby Liz. Peter then stares at the strange woman, Liz, my baby Liz, take us to the hospital. The woman nods, of course. She helps with Liz and then continues, this is Liz, are you Peter Darthmo? Married to Sarah, Peter then exclaims, Sarah. Peter hands over Liz to the woman, take her to the hospital. Peter turns around and runs back to the car wreck. The strange woman struggles with Liz, but does make it back to her car. Peter stumbles down at the car wreck, then crawls on his hands and knees to the back of the car. The back of the car is crumpled in from a rear impact. Sarah's body is deformed, crushed, and bloodied. Peter just murmured, oh god. He then stands up and walks away from the wreck. The same person that tried to help earlier tried to approach, but Peter motions him to back off. The strange woman gets Liz into the car, closes the back door and looks for Peter. She sees Peter in the distance, staggering towards the side of the bridge. Peter gets to the bridge's side railing, looks towards the strange woman, then towards the car wreck. Peter then hoists himself up over the railing and then drops out of sight. The strange woman gasps, closes her eyes and weeps. She then looks back at the road and can just make out something squirming towards her about 20 feet away. She keeps staring and thinks to herself, is that a snail? The woman then looks back at her car and knows she must get Liz to the hospital. She gets into the car and drives off. In the middle of the road, the snail moves onward. Several hours later, in the hospital's waiting room, the strange woman sleeps until a man gently shakes her awake. The man asks, You brought in Liz? Am I right? The strange woman nods, Yes. The man continues, You're also at the funeral. Who are you? Any relation to the Jacksons? The strange woman answers, Emma. And no. I'm not related to the Jacksons. You are... The man says, I'm Detective Blake Paulus. Please, call me Blake. Emma says, Well, Blake, I need some coffee. Then, I'll explain it all. After they go get some coffee, Blake and Emma are sitting in the hospital's cafeteria. Blake asks, So what brought you to the funeral? Emma explains, my father actually, my father's hobby. Over the years, he's been collecting articles and reports on strange deaths which appeared to be similar. Similar in the gruesome way that the bodies were found. Just like Miss Jackson in the old age home. Blake says, okay. Emma goes on. Another huge link with these deaths is that they're all the same family line. A huge revelation he was able to figure out just before he passed away. Blake. Sorry. Emma nods. He passed a few months ago. I found his notes. 
I read them and then I stored them away. Until I read this article about Miss Jackson and the description of her death. Blake says, yes, pretty shameful. Someone in the department leaked the report. So these notes and such, any clues on who's doing the killings? Emma hesitated a bit. Zero traces left by a killer. One case mentioned a woman was admitted that a snail was after her. She was committed and later, somehow in a locked cell, she was murdered with a face that looked like something dug into it. Blake is in heavy thought, staring at his cup of coffee. Emma asks, well? Blake answers, Liz is not safe here. Somehow Officer Dwayne Jackson was killed in a police precinct. His face was gouged out as well. I gotta get her far away from here. I agree, what about the snail bit? Today on the bridge I saw one. Blake gave her a funny look. A snail? I think the killer probably leaves a snail at the scene as a calling card or something. So the killer was on the bridge. Blake stood up. And at the funeral, somehow attacked Milton, then went after Liz and her folks. Twenty minutes later, Blake is in mid-conversation with Liz's doctor, while Emma is watching from several feet away. Doctor says, she is in stable condition at the moment, but moving her, especially to another hospital, can be risky, unless there's a ex of kin or a spouse that can sign off on her behalf. I'm obligated to keep her here on her observation. Blake insists, her family was just murdered, so she is definitely the next target. Doctor, you can post guards, but I won't sign off on a release. Blake walks away from the doctor and approaches Emma. Blake angrily exclaims, no go there, prick doctors. Emma asks, so what now? Can you get a court order? Blake. That's my only option, but first, post some cops at the room. Blake starts dialing on his cell phone, then asks, Do you have your father's notes? Emma answers, Yes, in my car. Blake, good. I'll need them to help convince the judge. An hour and forty minutes later, Emma is waiting in Blake's car. She looks over at the courthouse and sees Blake rushing out with a large box. Emma opens the door, and Blake gives her back the box, and says, Thanks, Emma. It worked. The judge signed off on our release, and I already called ahead. We agreed to move her to Baltimore. Emma was surprised. Wow, I'm glad I could help. Fifteen minutes of extreme driving. Blake drives up to the hospital emergency entrance. An ambulance is being loaded in there. Blake and Emma get out of the car and run over to the ambulance. Blake says, I'm Detective Paulus. He flashes his badge. Is this Miss Liz Darthmout? Moving her to Baltimore? EMS personnel. Yes. Blake adds, I'll be following along. Blake then turns to Emma. You coming? Emma answers, I'm staying here. Blake hands her a card. That's my info. Call me tomorrow. Maybe your father's notes can help us catch this killer. Emma nods. I hope so. The ambulance driver is ready to go. He yells out the window to Blake. You ready? Blake nods and is about to hop into his car. When Emma yells, Blake, wait. Emma runs over to Blake, leaving the box on the ground. Then does a weird kicking motion at Blake's feet. Blake jumps back a bit and looks confused at Emma. Emma just says, it's nothing, go on. Blake looks concerned for a second but then gets into the car. The ambulance then drives off and Blake follows. Emma watches the ambulance and Blake drive out of sight. She then looks down at her shoe and sees that there's some damage on the side of it. Emma then looks to the side and sees the snail that she kicked away from Blake's feet. The snail is on the side of the road, creeping along in the same direction as the ambulance went. There are some people around walking by. Some look at Emma with her strange fixation on a snail on the ground. Emma looks around and finds a stick. 
then prods the snail with it. Smoke rises up from the stick and starts breaking apart. Emma hurries back to the box, grabs it, and heads to the parking lot to retrieve her car. Six minutes later, Emma drives up and stops the car where the snail should be. And yes, there it is. She gets out of the car, goes to the trunk, and pulls out a cooler and blanket. Emma approaches the snail, puts down the cooler, takes off the lid. The cooler is a quarter full of water. Emma takes the blanket and grabs the snail. The blanket seems to be burning, so as quickly as possible, Emma pushes the blanket into the cooler, and then places back the lid. She puts the cooler into the trunk, gets into the driver's seat, does a U-turn and drives away in the opposite direction as the ambulance. Forty minutes of driving. Emma drives north, heading towards Stamford. Emma is on a rural road, no traffic is around. Emma then hears a slight thud sound coming from the trunk. She looks in the rearview mirror, then pops her head out the side window and looks behind the car. She sees a water trail. Emma pulls over and gets out of the car, goes behind the car and looks under and sees some dripping water. Emma opens the trunk and picks up the cooler to reveal that the cooler has a hole in the bottom. And then she is shocked to see the hole in the bottom of her trunk. Emma then looks back and exclaims, Oh hell. Emma gets back in the car, does a U-turn, and slowly drives back while keeping a close eye on the other lane. Three minutes later of doubling back. Emma spot the snail, does a U-turn again and pulls over. Emma sits and thinks for a moment. Gets out. Goes to the trunk and takes the tire iron out. Emma is now swatting at the snail with the tire iron, smacking it towards the side of the road. The snail is now off the road, on the dirt, battered but still moving on. Emma is getting frustrated with this situation. She sees a nearby boulder, then struggles to pick it up, and then drops it on the snail. Emma then slumps down and sits on another boulder nearby. Four minutes later, Emma is startled. The boulder which she dropped on top of the snail cracked in half. Emma walks over and observes the gooey crushed snail pulling itself away from the boulder. Emma walks back to the car and gets her cell phone, flips it open and just starts dialing. Two hours and 34 minutes later, while Emma is sitting by the side of the road, she sees a police cruiser in the distance. She gets up and starts waving it over. The police cruiser stops by Emma. She peers inside the car and says, No FBI? The lone trooper then replies, You're kidding, right? What's the problem? Emma answers, Fine. Let me show you something. 16 minutes of demonstrating how miraculous an invincible snail can be to a trooper. The trooper gets to his cruiser, pulls the radio mic from inside the car, and calls in. Central, come in. Radio replies, go ahead. The trooper, please patch me in to the captain, over. 46 minutes later, an unmarked car pulls up by the police cruiser. The trooper approaches the driver's side window. The window rolls down. The trooper just says, She's all yours. The two agents inside the car look at each other. Then they pull the car over to the side. Twenty minutes of demonstrating how miraculous an invincible snail can be to FBI agents. Emma is walking from her car with a box filled with her late father's notes. She then hands it over to one of the agents and says, This is everything. The other agent starts talking. Miss Emma Turner, you understand that going public with any of Emma interrupts. Please stop. I wouldn't have bothered calling you if I was planning to go public with this. Just protect us citizens from this threat, okay? The other agent then says, Yes, ma'am. Emma walks to the car, opens the driver's side door, 
looks back at the two agents, staring at the ground where the snail is. She then says to herself, I think I've doomed us all. Year 2011, Eureka. 3.30 p.m. An explosion occurs at the NH Newhorn Army Base. Two hours later, a CTNV-5 action news van drives up to the Army Base outer gate, and a person gets out, goes into the side of the van, and retrieves a shoulder mount camera. They start filming the base. Smoke is still billowing from the explosion. They pan around to also show all the debris that's scattered about. In the distance, you can see servicemen searching around the debris. After five minutes of getting footage, they return to the side of the van to bring out a tripod. They place the tripod down, set the camera on it, and point it towards the base. Just then, a military Humvee approaches the newscaster's position. It stops right by the van. Two soldiers leave the Humvee and walk towards the newscaster. The newscaster starts barking at them. Hey, I'm Jim Morris from CTNV 5 Action News. I'm standing outside of the perimeter of the base. One of the soldiers speaks up. Yes, I can see that, sir. We're not here to move you out. Jim then questions. Okay, then how can I help you guys? The soldier continues. Our base commander would like to give you a statement for the public. Jim is surprised by this. The soldier then says, if you could come with me to the Humvee, our commander is on the radio. I suggest you bring a pen and pad. Jim agrees, of course. Jim gets a pen and pad from the van and follows the soldier back to the Humvee. A soldier gives Jim headphones to put on. Then Jim starts jotting down the base commander's public statement. Eight minutes later, the Humvee drives away and Jim goes back to the camera. He notices that the camera is now pointing at the ground. Jim looks peeved. He fusses with the camera's position and hopes it will hold. Jim goes to the van and makes contact with his producer back at the station. I'm sending in some footage for B-roll. And get this, I got a statement from the base commander. It's not much, but it's better than a no comment at this time quote. Jim listens to his producer for a bit then acknowledges. 12 minutes until we go live. Great, I'll be ready. 12 minutes later, Jim is standing in front of the camera with the bass behind him. Jim can hear the newscast intro music through his earpiece. Then he listens to Ron Lamont. Jim is waiting for his intro. Jim starts. At around 3.30 p.m. this afternoon, an explosion occurred here at NH Newhorn Army Base. There is no explanation to what may have caused the explosion at this time, nor any news at how many have been injured or worse, but I do have an official release from the base commander. It reads, There has been an incident late this afternoon here at NH Newhorn. No known cause as of yet, but a full report will be made public once any new information becomes available. At this time, we are putting out a warning to the citizens of Eureka and anyone in the surrounding area that due to some chemical fumes released by the eruption, there may be some adverse effects on the populace. We ask that if any citizens in the area feel an onset of illness, especially if involving falling into a coma-like state. To please contact us directly here at the base. We have specialists standing by, ready to help. The number to call is 888-908-3410. Jim is now waiting in case Ron might have a question for him. But then the camera starts to slump and ends up pointing at the dirt. Jim is peeved again and can hear Ron ask, Jim, is everything all right there? In his earpiece. Jim answered, Everything is fine. Seems we have a tripod malfunction here. I'm Jim Morris at Army Base NH Newhorn. Back to you, Ron. Jim then hears his producer over the earpiece say, You're clear. Jim then walks towards the camera and speaks to his producer. 
You know, with all this talk of chemicals in the air, I'm thinking of moving. Jim is jolted by a prick in his leg. Then he falls to his knees, feeling his body go numb. Jim then falls to the ground, facing upwards. All he sees is the sky, and that the camera is perfectly pointed at his face. Through Jim's earpiece, you can hear yelling, Jim, and asking, Are you alright? Tearing through his pants and crawling up his body is the snail. The snail then reaches his face and decides that the easiest way to kill Jim is to dig in through his eye and gouge out his brain. The snail starts borrowing into Jim's eye. The acid it secretes burns the flesh. And faintly you can hear through Jim's earpiece. Is that 